Tonight on NJTV News, with more teens taking up vaping, the Surgeon General calls e-cigarettes a public health concern. Are they a healthy alternative to smoking or a gateway drug? With more than half a million New Jersey residents covered under Obamacare's Medicaid expansion, what happens when the next president takes office? South Jersey is less populated and more bucolic, but it requires the same resources as North Jersey, so why does South Jersey get shortchanged? So many released inmates return to prison. Could a tailor-made personal re-entry plan help them succeed where other programs fail? A sparkling tower of glass and steel has been sold. A Chinese company wanted it. A Kuwaiti company got it. Is Newark the new magnet for global enterprise? And a ladies' lunch. But instead of bridge and mahjong, they bring potluck and chainsaws. <laughs> Those stories and more next on NJTV News. Major funding for NJTV News provided in part by RWJ Barnabas Health, New Jersey Manufacturers, and Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Live from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. A heavy weight weighs in on the debate over vaping. Manufacturers say e-cigarettes are safe, but the Surgeon General contends the witch's brew of addictive chemicals they contain tricks teens into risking their health. Brenda Flanagan reports. It's a much better alternative than cigarettes is. The young manager at Ultimate Smoke and Vapor in Hoboken swears vaping electronic cigarettes that deliver water vapor and varying doses of nicotine helped him kick the dirty, dangerous habit of smoking tobacco. I was a smoker of cigarettes 14 years. Uh, I'm 18 months now, haven't touched a cigarette. But the Surgeon General says there's no conclusive proof that vaping helps adult smokers quit. And he's issued an alarm along with a new report that claims vaping can lead kids to start. New research has shown that kids who use e-cigarettes are more likely to use traditional cigarettes. The report notes one in six high school students said they'd used an e-cigarette within the past 30 days last year, 16 percent compared to just 1.5 percent in 2011, and almost 60 percent of those who used tobacco products also used e-cigarettes. It's the highly addictive nicotine that most concerns U.S. health officials. It can also have adverse effects on the developing brain of adolescents and young adults. These effects can lead to not only addiction, but also to deficits in attention and learning, reduced impulse control, and mood disorders. And the message from the report is clear. Nicotine-containing products in any form, including e-cigarettes, are not safe for youth. But it's good that the Surgeon General is taking the, the science that is out there that it shows that this is bad for your health and that people should not use this um, to quit smoking and not use it for fun like young people are. New Jersey banned the sale of e-cigarettes to minors back in 2010 and a new study shows if e-cigarettes are harder to get, kids are less likely to smoke, period. Study co-author Rahi Abouk of William Patterson University explains why. Kids uh, start using e-cigarettes e first because it's very appealing to them. There are many flavors and they think that it's very harmless compared to conventional cigarettes. However, after a while, they don't get enough nicotine out of that and they automatically would switch to conventional cigarettes which is uh, definitely more harmful. But in other countries like England, opinions differ. The Royal College of Physicians earlier this year issued an opinion on e-cigarettes that it claims laid to rest almost all of the concerns over these products. Smokers should be reassured that these products can help them quit all tobacco use forever. An e-cigarette advocate in New Jersey agrees kids need protection, but he opposes the U.S. campaign against vaping. The Surgeon General with this report is trafficking in fear and intimidation to do so at the expense of scientific integrity and um, at, at the expense of uh, adult awareness is, is ultimately going to be harmful. The Surgeon General's campaign kicked off only a few weeks before the new Trump administration takes over, so it's uncertain whether this new initiative will gather strength or go up in smoke. In Hoboken, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News.
breaking records. That tops tonight's Garden State Express, a banner year for a bear harvest. Our first stop, Andover Township, where a record 623 bears have been killed by bow and arrow or bullets in the 2016 annual bear hunt. And a psychology professor has broken his own record, having been arrested for protesting the bear hunt for a seventh time, which makes Bill Crane a repeat offender. The 72-year-old with a bum hip admitted he'd left the protesters' pen and walked to the way station where hunters were hauling in dead bears. The judge fined him and sentenced him to 10 days in jail, but not until semester break, leaving him free to protest tomorrow on the bear hunt's last day. Next to Lower Township, where, like the mythical Brigadoon, a relic of the railroad days, reveals itself once in a blue moon. When the wind and waves work just right, rusted rails and deteriorated wooden ties of century-old train tracks reappear along the Delaware Bay's edge near Sunset Beach. The old Atlantic City Railroad Company leased the tracks to the Cape May Sand Company, and both had a long run, providing jobs during the Great Depression. Though parts of track, according to a 1907 map, had long since washed away. The tracks first appeared this century two years ago, in sight of the World War I concrete wreck of the SS Atlantis. It's an ephemeral magnet for amateur photographers. Finally, South Orange, where middle schooler Jared Kofsky made a picture of a perfect, blooming, black-eyed Susan, backed by patriotic bunting adorning an historic Revolutionary War tavern, and posted it to a National Geographic kids website. That was five years ago when he was barely 13. Today, it's been selected to adorn Vice President Joe Biden's Christmas tree at the Naval Observatory. Just as 13-year-old wildlife photographer and Harding student Ashley Scully's Red Fox was last year. Jared Kofsky is now 18 with a passion for photojournalism and an amazing professional portfolio to prove it. And that's our Garden State Express for Friday, December 9th. Something up in your town? Tip us off. When New Jersey took advantage of Obamacare to expand Medicaid coverage for those without health insurance, it paid off. Now it may be rolled back by the Trump administration and replaced by block grants to states who will have more leeway to run Medicaid programs as they see fit. David Cruz looked into what that could mean for Medicaid recipients here. Until 2014, when the federal Medicaid program expanded under the Affordable Care Act, New Jersey was among the states with the smallest amount of growth in the program. But since New Jersey opted into Medicaid, the state has seen almost half a million new enrollees, and the heavily subsidized spending has grown to just over $14 billion. It was a pragmatic decision, Governor Chris Christie said at the time. But nowadays, the governor has been promoting the new administration's plan for Medicaid, mainly block grants. Yeah, I've spoken a lot to the president-elect about this, and, and I think he is going to fairly quickly um, make changes to the Medicaid program that gives much greater flexibility to the governors to decide what type of treatment, what type of exceptions, what type of requirements are particularly need for your state. Buzzwords like innovation and flexibility are frequently part of the discussion about Medicaid block grants. The new administration has been mostly vague on details, though. Here's Vice President-elect Mike Pence on the stump in November. I promise you, when Donald Trump becomes president of the United States, we're going to work with newly reelected majorities in Congress and we're going to block grant Medicaid to the states and allow states in America to innovate with consumer-driven, market-driven proposals to meet the health care needs of our most vulnerable people. But it's in the details where critics say the devil lurks. Ray Castro of the left-leaning New Jersey Policy Perspective says capping the program's funding, which is essentially what shifting to block grants will do, could affect tens of thousands of New Jersey's most vulnerable residents. We now receive about $3 billion uh, additional in the Medicaid program. The Medicaid program itself is a $15 billion program. So even if you get a 1% or 2% cut in the program, that's, a, that, that's hundreds of millions of dollars, that, and, and that's a cost that's shifted to the state. So the original proposal for a block grant down in Washington cut the program by $1 trillion nationwide over 10 years. 
And so you can see what the uh, you know, disastrous consequences that could be for our state. Medicaid covers half the babies born in the country, say federal administrators. It covers half the cost of long-term care, and 40% of the Medicaid budget goes to cover people with disabilities. Federal Medicaid administrators like Andy Slavitt say a cap is a cut, and with Medicaid, you don't have to cut much to get to the bone. They really mean uh, we want to cut the amount of money that the federal government is going to give to the state, to give to New Jersey, to take care of Medicaid patients. And the question is, really, what are you going to cut? Medicaid is an incredibly efficient program today, so there's not a lot of places to cut. And then you put on top of it things like the opioid crisis and other shocks to the system. It would be very difficult for a state to manage in a situation where the federal government uh, cut and capped what they were delivering. Like a lot of the new proposals hinted at by the new administration, we just don't know what a Medicaid block grant program will look like. But it's almost certain that New Jersey and most states will probably be seeing less. And critics say that could mean two steps back after the one baby step forward represented by the Affordable Care Act. For NJTV News, I'm David Cruz. Turning now to the state's business news, standing by at the Strategic Development Group studio at the NJCU School of Business is Rhonda Schaffler with a big payout from AT&T. Rhonda? That's right, Mary Alice. Some AT&T customers are getting refunds due to unauthorized charges on their cell phone bills. The Federal Trade Commission says it will issue $88 million in refunds to more than 2.7 million customers. Those customers received third-party charges on their bills for things like ringtones and text message subscriptions. The average customer refund will amount to $31. Two Riverfront Plaza, located in Newark, has been sold to a firm based in Kuwait. The Wall Street Journal reports the tower was sold for $165 million. That building is home to Panasonic's North American headquarters. According to the report, the building also attracted interest from investors in Malaysia, the Middle East and China. Employees at IKEA stores in New Jersey are getting longer paid parental leave starting in the new year. IKEA will offer new mothers and fathers four months of paid time off. Previously, the retailer gave birth mothers five days off of paid leave, followed by disability. Earlier this year, IKEA also raised its workers' minimum wage. The company this week reported a 20 percent rise in profits thanks to strong sales. Hyundai is recalling more than 41,000 minivans because the hoods can fly open while they're being driven. The recall covers entourage minivans made in 2006 through June of 2008. Meantime, U.S. regulators have issued an order to automakers telling them to speed up replacing defective airbags made by the Japanese supplier Takata. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration says the airbag recall affects about 42 million vehicles in the U.S. That is about one quarter of every vehicle on the road. The agency also today released an updated list of vehicles affected. Those airbags have exploded during accidents, killing at least 11 people in the U.S. In economic news today, a measure of consumer sentiment hit its highest level in nearly two years. It was also better than economists forecast. On Wall Street, stocks closed out the week with more records, the Dow surging to a triple-digit gain. And those are our top business stories for this Friday. When it comes to public funding, people in South Jersey have long suspected the state's doling out more to their wealthier North Jersey cousins. A new study from the Walter Rand Institute of Public Affairs at Rutgers University Camden demonstrates South Jersey is indeed getting short shrift. Aaron Delmore reports. Rutgers professor Shauna Shamus asked her student, a New Jersey native, what the difference is between the northern and southern parts of the state. And he put it this way. He said, well, when I think of North Jersey, I think of like McMansions and stockbrokers. And then when I think of South Jersey, I think more blue collar. <laughs> It's a total oversimplification in a lot of ways. But it emboldened Shamus's research on the distribution of government resources throughout the state. Her new report addresses whether South Jersey is getting its fair share of public goods. The short answer, 
No. Even taking into account uh, things like population or income, the split of public goods between North and South Jersey uh, seems unfair. It seems disproportionate. Public goods are things or services meant to benefit everyone, like public transportation and schools, health services and infrastructure. In a free market, the best goes to the highest bidder. So in these arenas, the government steps in to keep people without means from missing out. The research shows people are missing out, and by and large, they're in South Jersey. There's just a, a lower level of things that would make for the middle class in the southern Jersey counties and a higher level of uh, the, the things like um, public health problems, diabetes, uh, lower levels of uh, college education that would make for poverty or problems in South Jersey. We've long said that was the case, that the southern part of the state has gotten a lot less resources and, and you know, has higher unemployment, high, higher poverty issues, uh, and, you know, really has a weaker economy. We said it for years. Uh, lack of transportation, oh, we can go on and on and on. The northern counties are generally wealthier and more populated, likely due to proximity to New York City, also wealthier and larger than its neighbor, Philadelphia. Southern counties have fewer people who generally make less money. That means more tax dollars from the north, less from the south. More political representation in the north, less in the south. And while public goods aren't meant to be part of a pay-to-play system, North Jersey is paying and playing harder and reaping the spoils. Prior to the Economic Opportunity Act, 96 cents of every incentive dollar went to the northern half of the state. Now, we're not trying to say anything nefarious went on. All we're saying is we need to level the playing field. Congressman Donald Norcross represents Camden County and parts of Gloucester and Burlington counties. We're standing at an institution, one of only three four-year institutions in South Jersey. Uh, while there's 27 in the northern half of the state. All we wanted is our fair share. And the fact of the matter, there were not enough seats here for the students who wanted to stay in school in New Jersey. That was just one of the issues. Congressman Norcross said New Jersey legislators are always working to steer more federal dollars toward New Jersey. And while a rising tide lifts all boats, he said he just wants to make sure the water is level throughout the state. In Camden, I'm Erin Delmore, NJTV News. No one gets out of jail free. Without wraparound support services, a majority of the 10,000 inmates released each year are re-arrested. Four in ten return to prison. State lawmakers are scheduled to vote on a bill designed to help ex-convicts succeed in life on the outside. I recently asked one of its sponsors, Assemblymember Shavonda Sumter, how the Earn Your Way Out Act would work. The plan would work by assigning someone to work with the inmate, low-level offenses, so that they don't end up back incarcerated, and it would save millions of dollars. The, there are restrictions on this. There were, sex offenders, murderers wouldn't be part of this. Correct. It's for low-level, nonviolent offenders that we're talking about working with. They would earn credit uh, for actually doing well while in prison, actually following through with rehabilitative steps, and we would actually have corrections officers and parole officers working with them. And what resources would be available to them? So what we're talking about doing is having someone to work with them, similar to case management. Oftentimes, we're saying release, go into the world and be successful after you've been in a controlled environment. And the tools, I'm in behavioral health, for coping, for learning how to live on the outside are not yet uh, sharpened. So we really want to partner them with someone with different agencies and officers who will work with them so that they can be successful on the outside. And it's a housing job, a community? Housing, job, community approach also, uh, making sure that they have the proper identification, 
uh, so that they can be successful. The bill would also require a division of reentry and re rehabilitation services. Yes. Where would the money come from? So we're talking about moving monies from the Department of Corrections to go into uh, this program. We're also talking about saving dollars because you will not have people housed in prison. So this is truly ending that mass incarceration so we would save dollars on funding a person 24-7 care in a penitentiary to the tune of possibly $69 million within two years. Governor Christie has been a huge proponent of drug courts and criminal justice reform. Uh, former Governor McGreevy has opened yes. uh, reentry programs. Are you riding a wave? Of, there's a movement toward this, right? There is a movement towards it, which I'm proud to be a part of. It's something that's part of my passion and uh, legislative work that I'm happy to be a part of. We really need to uh, focus on how we're going to successfully have folks come back into our communities, especially for those low-level offenders. And really, then those funds can go towards some of our priorities that include education, that includes affordable housing, that includes making sure that they are a successful member of society and reunited with their families. The bill is made it out of committee. Yes. What is the likelihood that it passed the entire legislature? My hope uh, that is that it will be bipartisan support. We had great discussion in the legislature this week around the bill. It's unfortunate. I wish people for low-level offenses did not go to jail, that there were more rehab programs, but sometimes that's the pathway that they get caught in. But it shouldn't be a life trap. So this will at least give persons an opportunity to have a successful chance at rehabilitation. It's not just words that we use. Let me change the subject on you. Your name has been bandied about as somebody who might consider running for governor. Are you doing it? Well, I'm still, I, I decided not to do it, but to look at making sure uh, that my work uh, continues, uh, that I'm successful in the legislature with making sure that we're moving New Jersey forward. I'm committed to making sure that we have someone in the executive office, a Democrat preferably, uh, that will work with me as a partner to make sure that we build upon the steps that we've been making in the legislature. Lieutenant Governor, you think I'm going to let go, don't you? <laughs> I, I will not shy away for the opportunity to serve in the executive branch. I'm honored that my name uh, is still circulating. I'm honored that my work is respected, uh, but I'll continue to work for New Jerseyans because that's what I've been tasked with doing right now. Shavonda Sumter, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Geriatricians say as people get older, they need, their need for communities and activities grows as well. Maddie Orton found one group whose members tackle the process with chainsaws. Miriam Rosenstein's basement is a sight to behold. On any given Thursday, it's filled with sculptors chipping and carving and sanding away. 92-year-old Rosenstein is all business, wielding a chisel or a small circular chainsaw over a block of wood. She picked up the art form in her 60s and hasn't stopped perfecting it. When you have something like uh, wood or stone, it, it's different. Each piece of stone is different. Each piece of wood is different. And so when you're working on it, you probably have to work differently with each one than the one before. Rosenstein offered up her basement as a less crowded workspace for grateful friends from sculpting class. They all chipped in for an air filtration system, and years later, they still chip in every week with a potluck lunch. It's so much fun, and everybody critiques everybody else's work. I have told more people about Miriam because I think that she is the most fantastic person. To offer her house was very generous of her, I think. The basement, like the rest of the house, is filled with artwork, much of it Miriam's. She says when word got out that she works with wood, people just began bringing her pieces. Still, it's not an easy medium to mold. Same with stone. Rosenstein says sculptors can shape a piece for months, only to have a chunk of it simply break off. Maybe it gives you more patience. How do you mean? Well, instead of just giving up on it, you try to work something out with what you have. If Rosenstein sounds zen about the process, that's because there may be something therapeutic in it. This is the only thing that I love that I could just 
everything can go away. The, the sadness, the unhappiness. When I do this, everything goes away. And I just dwell on the art. Dolores Stewart is in her 80s. She worked as a driver for years to save up money for art supplies and classes. The focus of her work, happy people. Ever since I was small, I love faces. I love the old people faces. I love the creases. And I love it when they smile. Even though some teeth are missing, you see the joy. Stewart says in art, she found what gives her joy. I absolutely think art will take you further, live longer, be happier. But that has to be your niche. Whatever your bliss might be, Rosenstein says, don't let a late start prevent you from giving it a shot. Give it a try. Give it a try. In Maplewood, I'm Maddie Orton, Thanks NJTV News. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thanks for being here. Have a good weekend. PSENG, serving customers, strengthening the business community, and investing in New Jersey's future, and New Jersey Education Association.